Okay, I think this uh, couldn't be more stark in the difference between us and whatever the Home Minister has said. Let's start from the beginning. What did Perari and Anna say? He said, we have a two-language policy. The two-language policy is Tamil, or in your case, your home language, your mother tongue, and English, right? Only two languages. If everybody follows the two-language policy, that means people in Tamil Nadu, people in UP, people in Bihar, people in Rajasthan, people in Karnataka, and Maharashtra, and Punjab, if everybody follows the two-language policy, we get phenomenally good outcomes because there's a lot of scientific evidence that education in the mother tongue is where the greatest traction happens. We want to preserve our culture. The uh, most stable identity of our culture, the root of our culture is our language. Right? So everybody gets to preserve their language. And everybody gets to communicate not only with each other's state, but also the bulk of the world. For example, even Germans lean, learn English. Even the French learn English. Right? So you get the great luxury of having your own language, your own culture, your own heritage, and a global connect. Now, anybody who tells you that you have to go to a three-language formula first is basically just got, you know, fundamental flaw in the logic. Because why should I have a three-language formula? Supposing that somebody were to tell me I should have a three-language formula, let alone the Home Minister's comment, which is completely off logic. But a more logical point, which is still fallacy, is three language. What does three language mean? It says, you in Tamil Nadu learn Tamil plus English plus Hindi. You in Gujarat learn Gujarati plus English plus Hindi. You in Maharashtra learn Marathi plus English plus Hindi. Now my question is, why should the third language add any value? And the usual retort is, the third language can be used to communicate within India. But... Hindi is not intrinsic to at least 60-70% of the country. So why should we all learn a third language that we all don't inherently have in our blood, in our tongue, just for the sake of communicating with each other? That means for that percentage of the country that's not Hindi, clearly English is enough. Our home language plus English. For that percentage of the language who, or country whose mother tongue is Hindi, surely if they had learnt English, they would not need us to know Hindi. So it is complete language chauvinism. Even going to a three-language formula is utter language chauvinism. Because what it means is, those who learn Hindi will not even learn English. They will have a one-language formula for the Hindi belt and a three-language formula for all the rest of us who need to communicate with the one-language belt. Not only is it chauvinism, it is economically, like, uh, what can I say, uh, inverse logic. Because there are very few Tamil, English, Gujarati, Marathi, uh, you know, Kannada, uh, Punjabi, Bengali speakers going and looking for work in the Hindi belt. There are tens of millions of people from the Hindi belt coming to other places to look for work. Does it make sense for somebody to learn the language where they're going to look for work? Or does it make sense for the people who are giving the work to learn the language of those coming to seek work? It makes no sense whatsoever. So, first of all, even a three-language formula is a fallacy. A three-language formula really translates to a three-language formula for that 50% of the country or whatever that doesn't speak Hindi. And then a one-language formula for the remaining whatever, not even 50, 30, 40% of the country that speaks Hindi. And this should be averaging out to some 1.6 or something language form. It makes no sense whatsoever. Now to say that you must drop English and speak Hindi, that is exactly the retrograde kind of taking India into the dark ages logic that has led to this government's economic failure. We want to be open to the world. We want to transact with everybody. The, the problem of maladministration and failure of governance at the union government is not to bring everybody else down to your level of failure, is to try and learn from those who are succeeding and elevate those states up to everybody else's standard. So don't tell us not to use English. Figure out how to get the rest of the people how to learn English, which you have not been able to do for all the years you've been in governance, right? So uh, one government's and one minister's administrative failure 
should not be a reason to retard the rest of the society. Very clear? So talking about the property tax, we are seeing uh, opposition parties here uh, condemning the raise of the percentage of property tax. Uh, this already being an intricate subject that no common man is not able to understand at the first beginning. How are you seeing these protests that are uh, ongoing now? AIADMK continuously and the BJP today as well have uh, uh, you know condemned the raise in the percentage of the property tax and have uh, started protests. Uh, I'm not overly worried about political protests. So let me just talk about policy, right? Um, I don't know. Like there, there's two approaches that converge at the same place. The first approach starts with the 15th Finance Commission. The 15th Finance Commission, in its terms of reference, has clearly stated that unless uh, urban body, I mean local bodies make certain changes to the property tax and to the floor revenues that are raised through these kinds of taxes. Mm -hmm. They will not be eligible for grants from the union. Our tax money coming back, whatever, one small fraction of our tax money coming back, even that we will not be eligible for, our local bodies will not be eligible for unless they make certain changes in the rate. We have already shown the mathematical calculation of what that would uh, lead to a loss of uh, somewhere between 30,500 and 15,000 crores. This calculation, in fact, would have kicked in last year itself. But the 15th Finance Commission, because, you know, it had a one-year interim report and then a five-year report, it specifically stated that because of COVID, you're going to get an exemption for the year 2021. And the 21-22 year, before the end of the fiscal year, you must notify the changes. Otherwise, you're not eligible for the grants going forward. Now, this is a state that has already lost a lot. Every single time we have been to Delhi in the last three, four months, we have brought up with the Union Finance Ministry that we lost almost 5,000 something crores of grants because the previous ADMK administration had not run the local body elections. It was conditioned on that. So we are not guys to follow in the failure of our predecessors when they've already lost 5,000 crores by not doing something that the Finance Commission required. Mm -hmm. How would we be justified in calling them incompetent and immoral if we went ahead and again failed to do something that now lost us three times the amount of money? So the fact that it is in the Finance Commission is not questionable. Not only, uh, you know, you've read in the press, not only have uh, advisors like ours or all economists agreed that that's there, because it's black and white. Anybody who can read English knows, or, or, or Hindi, where the report came out, can tell. But... More than that, Dr. Anup Singh, who is a member of the finance, who was a member of the 15th Finance Commission, he himself has given a statement that this was the intent of what the Finance Commission wanted. They wanted to see a sirdhirtam, uh, 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 what do you say, uh, uh, improvement, uh, rejuvenation of local body finances. So this is the first way of looking at it. The second way of looking at it is, what kind of state are we and what kind of uh, citizens do we have and what is their economic condition. So if you start from that perspective, uh, in my budget reply, I gave the statement that we are not a poor state, right? right? We have about seven and a half to eight crore citizens and our GSDP is about 24 lakh crores. That means more than three lakh rupees per person. Even on FX terms, that's about 4,000 US dollars. That is not a poor state. There are many indicators to support this. But what really amazed me was what I saw in the JPAL, MIDS, University of Michigan kind of baseline survey, which was shown to me for the first time a little while ago, that I also cited in my speech in the assembly that 75% of our families own their own house, as high as 90% in rural and 60% in urban. More than 60% own two-wheelers, 50% own fridges, 90% own... Uh, smart, I mean, um, cell phones. So we are an aspirational society. Now, you cannot fault one basic number. All the way across ADMK, DMK, ADMK, DMK, between 2003 and 2014, the state's own revenues as a percentage of GSDP. Now, what does that mean? doesn't matter if the economy is doing well or bad. As a percentage of the total production of the state, the state's own revenues used to be between 9 and 10 percent. So ever since the lady went to jail, you know, our former chief minister, Ms. Jailata, in 2014 when she was in prison, and after that the administration started decaying. Ever since then, 
the revenue started dropping right. as a percentage of gsdp i'm not talking about absolute numbers mm. I'm talking about as a percentage of the uh, economy mm. and they dropped 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 prior to uh, covid they were already below 7% and after covid they dropped below 6% now just think about what that means if i say right now there's let's say conservatively a 3% gap a 3% gap on a 24 lakh crore gsdp is 72000 crores 72000 crores is greater than the revenue deficit of the state so what has really happened if i do it mathematically i can show you what has really happened is that revenues have fallen off a cliff no politician can cut spending fast enough because a lot of it is non discretionary salaries pensions etc and that which is discretionary we still have to face re-election so we can't cut truly to match the level of fall off so 100% of our problem started with the fall off in revenue inability to cut spending both structurally and politically therefore starting to become a revenue deficit state till 2014 revenue neutral state tamil nadu was one of the best administered states financially across all parties i'm not even talking politics here from 2014 we went from being a revenue neutral state to a revenue deficit huge revenue deficit state i hope you saw this morning statistics some place published number one state in debt tamil nadu mm-hmm. number one state in revenue deficit after i have made a correction and improved over what mr ops left behind in his budget we are still the worst revenue deficit state in the whole country so these things need to be fixed and there are really only two components to fix the first component is to prevent leakages corruption you know revenue loss in commercial tax in uh, um uh, excise and alcohol in mining etc which we have a plan but the second is that no government can make money unless the rates and the fees are set according to the scale of the economy and inflation in most advanced countries everything is indexed to inflation pension benefits are indexed to inflation and rates and taxes are indexed to inflation and charges are indexed to inflation everything is indexed to inflation so that the, the the budget automatically comes in balance it is not a political question anymore in fact the 15th finance commission has recommended that it says that eventually you must put everything indexed to inflation so that you don't have to have a big political fight about it actually brilliant advice from learned people right, right? so that we need to do at some point and if we don't do that there is no way you can fulfill the needs of an aspirational society right i have all these statistics here look at the cost of laying a road in urban areas has gone up. the last time property tax was reset in, in chennai is 98 between 98 and now the cost of laying let's say a kilometer of road has gone up about eight times how can we lay roads for the people right so when your cost keep going forget all that is it fair in a society where government employees get adjusted every year twice for inflation what we call dns allowance but for 10 years we have not changed the payment to the widows and the disabled and the old age citizens a thousand rupees what do you mean their cost of living doesn't go up of course it goes up for everybody so people who are making on, on average 75 80000 rupees which is probably the average government servant employee across all categories get adjusted for inflation and people who make 12000 rupees or 1000 rupees a month have not been adjusted for inflation for 10 years is this what social justice looks like is this what a fair society looks like of course it's not so at some point we have to decide if the government has no source of revenue we may as well close the government and go home we have to make the revenue somewhere what we have done though in this thoughtful exercise on the property tax is made it much more progressive than it ever was right So I'll just leave you with three points on the property tax. Number one, the lowest, smallest houses are only going up by between 25 and 50 percent. The highest is going up 200 percent. Number one. Number two, after these changes have been made, we are still at half or one third the level of Bangalore or Pune or Indore or uh, uh, you know any. You pick any city in India, we are still far below. Right. Number three. if we cannot make progressive taxation revenues how is a government supposed to run right I mean, there's just no choice so at some level though the timing was not of our uh, choosing mm. and it was a gun to the head to lose money and we actually 
acceded to the logic, unlike the previous government that gave up 5,000 crores of union government funding just so a couple of ministers could steal uninterrupted by not running local bodies and take 100% of the contracts. We still have a conscience and we play according to the philosophy we state, which is social justice. So we came from that perspective and I assure you that we will do more of everything, more uh, revenue correcting. It is my stated intent that we should go back to 9% of, of GSDP as our revenue. Mm. Right? That's what, uh, I, uh, you know, and let's put this in context. If I go back to 9 or 10, and let's say the government, the union government gives me 2 or 3, or 3, 3 and a half, we're still 13 and a half or so GSDP. You know what a, what a rich country does? About 20%. You know what a really high quality of life country like a Scandinavia does? About 30% of GSDP or GDP. So the government can provide services relative to the amount of money it makes. Mm. Progressive societies make a lot of money and provide a lot of services because what you can do on the way in, you can make it very progressive. Mm. You can say the poor pay almost nothing, the rich pay a lot. Right. On the way out, you can make it very like reverse progressive. The poorest get the greatest benefits of free school, free health, free education, you know, subsidized housing, um, you know, um, whatever, subsidized electricity, and the riches get to pay full market or above market rate for it. Right? So this is how, this is what government is here for. There is an essential component of government that is redistributive because fair, you know, open markets, even if they are 100% fair, will, real, will result in a uh, what do you say, economic stratification and some people getting very rich and some people saying even if they are fair and it's very hard to find truly fair neutral markets anywhere in the world because both capitalism and democracy can be hijacked by those in money with money, those who are hugely successful to subvert the fairness so it makes it even more incumbent on the government to play this role of collecting the right percentage of its revenues from those who can afford to pay, who are succeeding, who are benefiting from the ecosystem and use it to prop up the lives of the poor, the average citizen through public goods and services, through safety net, etc. That's our job. It is ridiculous that property taxes have not been raised in 24 years in China. It's, it's beyond like irrational. The courts have opined multiple times. I hope you know the history. Just go and look up how many judgments have come. Right? But what is the distinction? The distinction is exactly this article what I showed you. Those who feel the people are with them, those that the people trust, those that have the political will because they are connected to the people, they can raise the taxes and deliver the results from those increased taxes. Right? Those who do not have the political will, those who are afraid, what happens if I raise the tax, simply will not do all this. Right? So that's the distinction. The distinction is, if you have a strong political philosophy that says social justice, you know, uh, self-respect, equal opportunity through education, high quality public goods and services to bring up a equal life of dignity, then you have to raise the revenue for it. You can't just say it and not do anything about it. And some of that revenue will come through growth, through investment, through jobs. Some of it will come through cutting down malfeasance and, and wrongdoing. Some of it will come on improving efficiency of uh, outgoings. Mm -hmm. I, I almost intervened in the assembly. I don't know if you watched the proceedings today. Yes. I was going to give a long uh, explanation, but I didn't want to waste everybody's time. So I asked my mother I compatriot. I said, do you really want to get into this topic and then I'll go deep down? And he said, no, and he backed off. <laughs> but I, if I really get into the topic, I could tell you six different ways that we increase the scrutiny and professionalism around evaluating the gold loans. That hugely helped. What could have been five or six times this bill ended up being this small because we truly cross-referenced, applied, sent in audit teams, which is under the finance department, sent uh, cross audit. That means I won't allow Trinil Valley auditors to approve Trinil Valley uh, reimbursements. I'll send Chennai auditors to... Then we gave them training. Then we gave them... And after all that I say, if somebody genuinely believes they have been 
wrongly treated we have an appeal process let them come we'll take it but this is indicative of how rotten government was not just on the way in but on the way out also i mean just think about it right we, if if we had sanctioned I, i'm just picking a number off the top of my head right now we gave about 5000 something crores if we had not played to this level of professionalism data analysis so forth that number could easily have been 15000 crores 15000 crores imagine what a waste of money that would have been what an atrocious immoral expenditure of money if people who were purposely gaming the system empty covers with no jewels in it one name 10 loans in 10 societies one family 15 loans in 15 different names if we had not caught all this i'm still saying we didn't catch all of it because we want to be that way right it's better that a few guilty go free than any innocent gets punished that kind of principle but this is what good administration does. So we, we, we increase the revenues on the way in by preventing corruption, wrong assessment, uh, you know, rent seeking, uh, lunja mula. We increase the efficiency on the way out by preventing wasteful spending, fraud, you know, malfeasance. And then we raise the revenues from those who can afford to pay. If we have all these, we are on a trajectory that's unbelievable, right? Well, how did I finish my, uh, my budget speech? I said, the future looks very bright. The best is yet to come. Mm. But that is the hope that the people have in us, and we need to raise the money and run the administration to that level. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, I'll not do anything, I'll not take any action, I'll not have any strategy, and then you expect to get progress. It just doesn't work. So I don't care about protests and all that. We have our own mechanisms where we are continuously gauging how the people react. So far, we have not seen anything to indicate that it has been like uh, completely unfair, right? Let me put it another way. Uh, if anything, uh, it may not have been progressive enough. And what math we have done, even for the poorest, smallest houses, mm -hmm. the rate uh, increase may be no more than a few hundred rupees a year, not a few hundred rupees a month, a few hundred rupees a year, which means like one or two rupees a day at best, at most, I mean. Right? Yeah. So if, if we get data to suggest that's, you know, causing some uh, complexity in people's lives, we'll adapt. But the key is not this. In my opinion, the two keys to doing good uh, revenue management. One is good communication. Mm -hmm. We must tell the people, either kahe the pandrom. I mean, I'm doing this for this reason, in this way, and this is why it's fair, and this is why it's right, and this is why it's good for your future. Mm -hmm. So. That communication is an important component. The other important component is, what do you do with the money? So if in two years the roads are fantastically better, if in two years the drains are perfectly working, if in two years everybody gets 24-7 water, or at least a significant improvement to where they are now, yeah. then that's what good administration, good governance, and good politicians are supposed to do. We're supposed to promise a vision, get everybody to play in the game, fairly and give them the vision, deliver the vision we promised, right? That's, that's how it's supposed to work. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure why people should see this as a show. I mean, that's what the Finance Commission says. It's not like innovative, out-of-the-box thinking. It's not like we're the first guys in the world to think about this. You know what I mean? 